If I were to ask you what you know about Rolls-Royce, most of you would probably say it's a British company that makes luxurious and extravagant cars. But in reality, let me tell you, it's much more than that. Rolls-Royce is not just a simple thing. It's part of a tremendously great company that branched out and produced many diverse products. However, this great company made a colossal mistake one day in 1971. After that, the company crumbled and its employees and engineers were in disarray. Disasters unfolded within the company and the British government had to intervene because there were 80,000 employees on the brink of being laid off. Yet all these interventions were in vain. And in February of 1971, Rolls-Royce officially declared bankruptcy and entered receivership. And due to that, the luxury car division you see today was lost from the parent company. However, a miracle happened. And after this miracle, the company regained its footing and has now become a cornerstone in the world of nuclear submarines and one of the leading giants in the defense industry worldwide. Today's story is about the bankruptcy and resurgence of Rolls-Royce and how this company lost its most important sector, the sector that gave it global fame, the automobile sector. How did they lose this sector? What's the story behind the engine that completely wrecked the company? That's what we'll uncover in today's episode. The Second World War brought remarkable advancements in the aviation sector, leading to the growth of numerous companies in this field due to the demands of wartime. However, after the war ended, these companies began to ask themselves, what's next? The answer was to convert the technology used in military aircraft into commercial aviation, moving people and generating profits for their companies. However, a significant challenge arose. The cost of this technology was exceedingly high which translated into exorbitant airfare prices, making it inaccessible for most people. Therefore, several companies began to innovate and develop larger aircraft with extended ranges to address this issue. Leading the way were American giants like Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and Lockheed, with Boeing being the foremost. These aviation companies were responsible for planning and designing the new aircraft, but they did not manufacture the engines because the engine manufacturing industry was intricate complex, and highly costly. These aviation companies could opt for specialized engine manufacturers to meet their precise needs instead of going through the trouble of making their own engines. At that time, there were three or four dominant engine manufacturers in the world, General Electric and Go Beyond from the United States, and Rolls-Royce from Britain. Competition among engine manufacturers was fierce, with each vying for contracts with a handful of airlines. Rolls-Royce, however, struggled to secure lucrative contracts compared to its competitors, and its reputation suffered as a result. This was evident with their RB211 engine, which they developed for the Boeing 747 aircraft. However, Boeing eventually chose a different engine supplier, leaving Rolls-Royce in a precarious position. But despite all that Rolls-Royce remained undeterred and committed to further development, and in the mid-1960s, Rolls-Royce unveiled a groundbreaking idea for their new RB211 engine. On paper, this engine was nothing short of revolutionary. It was designed to be lighter than its competitors while delivering a thrust of up to 24,000 pounds, making it highly efficient in terms of fuel consumption. What set this engine apart was its use of an innovative material, carbon fiber. This material was already known for its lightweight and incredible strength, and its application in aircraft blades was a game changer in the aviation industry at that time. Leading this ambitious project was Adrian Lombard, one of Britain's most brilliant engineering minds. Developing such an advanced engine required substantial investment, and even with Rolls-Royce significant financial commitment, it couldn't match the extravagant spending of its American counterparts. The Americans were known for their lavish expenditures, making any comparison between the two almost impossible Anyway, during that time, Europe was forging collaborations among its nations with plans to create Airbus, an ambitious endeavor that included the development of the Airbus A300 aircraft. Britain was part of this collective effort, and the aircraft being designed required an engine with a thrust of 47,500 pounds. Rolls-Royce was one of the few companies in Europe capable of producing such an engine, and this prompted the British government to lobby European countries involved in the Airbus project to choose Rolls-Royce as their engine supplier. So during that period, 
Rolls-Royce found itself managing two major projects, the RB211 and the engine for the Airbus A300, the RB207. These endeavors were draining substantial financial resources from the company. Let's return to the RB211 engine. The Rolls-Royce company began exploring opportunities to offer this innovative engine to American Airlines for their fleets. They reached out to Lockheed, an American aerospace manufacturer that was concurrently working on the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, a large and impressive aircraft competing with Boeing's 747 and McDonnell Douglas DC-10. The TriStar was designed to carry up to 400 passengers and cover long distances, posing a significant challenge in terms of passenger capacity and range during that era. The TriStar indeed required three engines, and Rolls-Royce, with its RB211, emerged as a suitable candidate to supply these engines. In 1968, a pivotal agreement was reached between Rolls-Royce and Lockheed, stipulating that Rolls-Royce would deliver 150 engines by September 1971. This agreement marked a turning point for Rolls-Royce, as it secured a significant contract in the highly competitive American aviation market. Despite the financial strains of managing multiple projects simultaneously, Rolls-Royce's commitment to innovation and collaboration ultimately paid off, solidifying its position as a major player in the global aviation industry. In addition to that, Rolls-Royce had agreed on a fixed price for the first 600 engines they will produce. However, things took an unexpected turn, and problems started surfacing within Rolls-Royce from various angles. Brace yourself and witness what unfolds, because two supermarket chickens destroyed the entire concept of the RB211 engine and cast a shadow of failure over Britain Giant's future. In the mid of 1969, Rolls-Royce found itself in a huge problem with its revolutionary engine. It turned out to be more complicated than they had ever imagined. It was their first venture into this kind of development, demanding more time and an exorbitant amount of money to ensure its success. Additionally, substantial funds were needed to craft the machinery that would produce the new engine components. And even when Rolls-Royce finally started to see some progress and managed to produce the first prototype of this engine in mid-1969, the results were disheartening. Fuel consumption was higher than what they had agreed upon with Lockheed. Moreover, its thrust output barely reached 35,000 pounds, falling short of expectations. Oil leaks were an issue as well, but the most challenging problem lay in the engine's new carbon fiber blades. As mentioned earlier, these engine blades were crafted from carbon fiber, a cutting-edge technology that has proven incredibly resilient. However, trouble arose when they began conducting tests on the engine, particularly the bird strike test. In flight, aircraft engines are vulnerable to bird strikes, which can lead to catastrophic consequences. To test the engine's resilience to bird strikes, they halted and started the engine multiple times. Then they throw supermarket bought chickens at a precise speed into the heart of the engine. Here's where disaster struck. The impact caused all the blades to shatter, rendering the entire engine useless. Rolls-Royce was now faced with a perplexing dilemma. They had initially considered a backup plan involving the use of titanium blades instead of fiber carbon. But transitioning to this alternative meant encountering substantial challenges and required meticulous engineering and additional time and funding. In addition to all these disasters, another calamity struck with the untimely death of engineer Adrian Lombard, the leader of this project. He was the sole individual within Rolls-Royce at the time who possessed the capability to tackle challenges of this magnitude. They faced yet another catastrophe when Britain withdrew from the Airbus project. This meant that the aircraft engine for the Airbus A300 would not be sourced from Rolls-Royce. In essence, all the effort, time, and resources that were poured into developing the RB211 engine, along with the funds invested, seemed to be wasted in vain. This chain of events led Rolls-Royce to the brink of collapse around mid-1970. There were no funds available even to cover employee salaries, let alone thousands of contractors and small-scale suppliers. This crisis wasn't just a catastrophe for Rolls-Royce, it reverberated across the entire nation of Britain. We're talking about 80,000 employees working at Rolls-Royce at that time. It's a staggering number, and the warning signals were flashing red for the British government, 
signaling the urgent need to intervene and rescue the company by any means necessary. Indeed, that's exactly what happened. The government began its intervention, providing some financial support and meddling in the company's affairs, but without producing any tangible results. All of these efforts merely served as painkillers, and Rolls-Royce continued to crumble. Then, on February 4, 1971, Rolls-Royce was placed under judicial custody and declared bankrupt. In a lightning-fast response, the British government stepped in decisively, making the momentous decision to nationalize this vital company. The move aimed to secure the company's assets and prevent foreign creditors from gaining control over these critical national assets. We must emphasize that we're not talking about just any company. We're talking about a company that manufactured some of the most crucial weapons for Britain at the time. This issue has now become a matter of British national security. The first action taken by the government was to establish a new company, also named Rolls-Royce. It began purchasing the assets of the old company and started selling off the divisions that were not essential to Britain at that time. Among these divisions was the automotive section, which was acquired by a company called Vickers. Eventually, in 2002, it ended up with the German automaker BMW. It's worth noting that there was fierce competition, almost a battle between BMW and Volkswagen over acquiring Rolls-Royce. In the end, BMW emerged victorious, gaining control of the company. Another crucial move made by the government was the decision to terminate the disastrous RB211 project, which had caused significant setbacks and ended the deal with Lockheed. However here, a truly remarkable miracle occurred, as I mentioned in the introduction to this episode. Just before the government closed the RB211 project, the CEO of Rolls-Royce at that time, in a last-ditch effort, attempting to bring back a man named Stanley Hooker to Rolls-Royce. Hooker was one of the engineering geniuses in this company, regarded by many as a titan within the organization. Even though Hooker had retired, and amidst the turmoil that the company was facing, Rolls-Royce believed that bringing him back might be the only way to rescue them from the crisis. Indeed, Stanley Hooker returned to the company and witnessed the colossal disasters that had unfolded. He realized that he would need the assistance of the experienced minds who had been with Rolls-Royce for over 35 years. These were not just any engineers, they were the protégés of Henry Royce himself, the founder of the company. Although their ages had surpassed 70, they agreed to help and quickly came together as if they were rejuvenated. At that time, Stanley Hooker also recruited engineers from various projects within Rolls-Royce. He formed an extensive team with the singular goal of addressing the issues plaguing the RB211 engine and putting the company back on its feet. Indeed, they finally managed to rescue the company and the engine in less than a year. They also improved and boosted the engine's thrust to exceed 50,000 pounds, compared to the initial 42,000 pounds. Enthusiasm returned, and it ignited a fire in the young engineers to rebuild the company from scratch and address all the problems that had accumulated over the past decade. At this moment, the British government realized that they were on the verge of completing this engine, and they decided to capitalize on it. The government then initiated negotiations with Lockheed, proposing a new deal. Initially, the government refused to pay the hefty penalties stipulated in the old contract. Instead, they proposed that both parties share the cost increase in the price of the engine, and also they suggested cutting roughly half of the penalties. Lockheed, faced with no other viable options and already heavily dependent on the troubled TriStar project, reluctantly agreed to these adjustments. Lockheed had been also teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, and the idea of seeking another engine manufacturer would have been a time-consuming endeavor they simply couldn't afford. This agreement marked a pivotal moment as it allowed both Rolls-Royce and Lockheed to move forward and salvage what was left of their respective projects. It was a critical turning point in this tumultuous journey of innovation, financial woes, and government intervention. So, they did indeed reach an agreement for Lockheed to take over the engine project. In reality, the engine was completed on April 14, 1972. Just 12 days later, on April 26, this engine was installed on a Lockheed TriStar aircraft. The very engine that had initially threatened to bring down Rolls-Royce ended up being the same engine that saved the company and redeemed its reputation from the brink of disaster. Afterward, 
they continued to develop this engine further and built upon it creating the Trent family of engines. These engines now deliver exceptional performance, establishing Rolls-Royce as the second largest engine manufacturer globally, right after the famous American company General Electric. Due to this crisis, Rolls-Royce expanded its portfolio to manufacture almost every type of engine imaginable. They ventured into producing engines for ships, submarines, and even nuclear-powered submarines. The company's diversification and resilience in the face of adversity transformed it into a powerhouse in the world of engine manufacturing. As we close the chapter on this incredible journey, I hope you've been inspired by this remarkable tale of Rolls-Royce, a company that faced adversity head-on and emerged stronger than ever. If you found this video insightful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Thank you.